back to somewhat normalcy. Um, okay, so let me just start out with a word of prayer for us, and we'll dive right into the lesson. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful to be gathered here this morning to worship, Father, and uh, to study your word, Father. I just ask for your Holy Spirit's presence to dwell in us, to open our hearts and our minds, to make our hearts pliable, that we would be willing and able to accept your word, but above all, to be able to understand what it is that we're looking at, Father, as we study uh, the book of Jonah today, Father. I ask for your blessing to be upon each and every one of us today, Father, and I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Okay, so, uh, this is lesson 12, second to last lesson for this quarter, and uh, the, the heading is The Restless Prophet. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're looking at the book of Jonah today, mainly the focus is in Jonah, so if you want to keep your book marked there. Um, so, I usually start with the memory text, and the memory text is found in Jonah, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, and it reads, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more as we get into the lesson and see what's really being said there. Uh, so I'm just going to read Sabbath afternoon. I just usually read through it, so I'm just going to read through it just briefly. Uh, one of the most interesting stories in Scripture is to be that of Jonah. Here was a prophet of God. Someone called him God, and yet, what? He ran away from God's call? Then after being persuaded in, in a dramatic way to change his mind and obey the Lord, he did so, but then only to do what? To complain that the people to whom he was called to witness actually repented and were spared the destruction that otherwise would have been theirs. Uh, what an example of someone not at rest, not at peace, even to the point where he cried out, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Jesus himself re uh, referred to the story of Jonah, saying, The men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Uh, Matthew 12, 41. Greater than Jonah indeed. If not, he couldn't be our Savior, of course. So, uh, any questions so far? Comments? Okay. Oh, let's just dive right in and go to Sunday's lesson. Uh, Sunday's lesson is entitled Running Away. Okay. Why is he running from God? Well, you know, this is the beauty of what we find in, in the Bible, is that we find many men of God that, for one reason or another, you know, didn't really measure up to what their calling was. You know what I mean? Think of, think of just about almost a lot of prophets in the Bible. I mean, from Moses, right? Moses said he wasn't qualified, right? Um, you know, when you read like Jeremiah, uh, you know, being too young to, to even speak, you know, he says, but I'm but a, but a child, how am I to speak? Um, well, in this case, you know, you see somebody that's a prophet that had many failures. We'll, we'll see as we get into it. But once again, the question was, how could he be a prophet and yet not, not do the will of God, what God is requiring of him? Yeah, well, I mean, think of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet of God, right? Remember Balaam, the story of Balaam? Yeah, and what was Balaam doing? Well, he was getting paid by the king to curse God's people, right? So we see that the thing is, is that we see these people in the Bible, they're still just people. You know, even if they're a prophet or whatever they might be, uh, they still have their, their faults and you know, their downfalls and whatnot. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. 
absolutely. That's, that's right. We have to see the bigger picture. We have to see the bigger narrative. We have to really know what's going on with history, what's going on in, in the time period of, that he's living in, uh, what he's up against. So I'll give a quick example to kind of help out. Um, so, and then we're going to see, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give a brief uh, little insight as to Nineveh and what type of place it was at this time. Okay? Uh, which, by the way, Nineveh was the capital of Syria. You know, Syria is where you do enemy. Uh, pagan culture that worships false gods. But, so think about it this way. It's, it would be the same thing. And the example is, is pretty much the same as it was then. So think if, if God called you today to go to ISIS and, and tell them in 40 days, you, you know, you're going to be annihilated. You think you'd be welcome there, especially if you're preaching a religion contrary to their religion. Remember, these were idol worshippers. You know, they were they were the Gentiles, of course. They weren't God's people, as Pastor mentioned. So, how would you react if you were told to go preach to ISIS and tell them that in 40 days they were going to be destroyed? That's that's exactly right, and that's exactly what he did. Um, okay, so uh, let me just give an insight just briefly. Okay. Uh, in Jonah's time, Nineveh had become the mightiest city on earth. Its walls were 100 feet high and wide enough to accommodate three chariots riding side by side. The walls were surrounded by a moat 150 feet wide and 60 feet deep. Okay. Um, it, it's believed that Nineveh could withstand a 20-year siege. So, you know, it was a big, great city, a lot of wealth. Um, and uh, this is what I found interesting. Uh, Nineveh's willingness to repent may have been helped by a plague in 765 BC, a solar eclipse two years later in 763 BC, and another plague four years later in 759 BC. After Nineveh repented, the city stood for another 150 years until the Babylonians overthrew Nineveh in 612 BC. Okay. A little bit of insight. I'll, I'll give a little bit more. Well, let me just throw it in there as well. We're there anyway. Let me just get a little bit more on the inside of this uh, of this uh, city. Give me one second here. Um, so, 120,000 people. The capital was Assy the Assyrian Empire, as I mentioned before. The Assyrian armies were some of the most vicious in the Near East. Their cruelty was well known throughout the Mediterranean basin. They not only attacked enemy strongholds, but they also destroyed them. They brutally murdered the opposition and took thousands of young people as their slaves. You know, and when we look at the lesson, uh, there was something that I found really interesting. Uh, it says, uh, in typical Near Eastern manner, a decree was declared by the king of Nineveh in order to demonstrate a change of heart, everyone including animals, uh, no, sorry, let me back, I apologize, it's right here, okay, uh, when the Assyrian king took lashes, hundreds of thousands of prisoners were impaled, hardcore supporters of King Hezekiah were flayed alive, anybody know what flayed means? Yeah, skinned, they were skinned alive, so they were pretty cruel. Um, uh, but anyway, going forward, so let's just let's, let's dive into Sundays. It says, uh, Jonah was a mainly, amazingly a successful missionary. At the same time, he also was a very, reluct a very reluctant one, at least at first. When at, whatever Jonah was doing, God's call interrupted his life in a big way. Instead of taking God's yoke upon his shoulders and discovering for himself that his yoke is easy and his burden light, Matthew 11:30. Jonah decided to find his own rest, and that was by running in the opposite direction from where God was calling him to go. Okay, so the question is, where was Jonah hoping to find peace and rest from God's call? 
how well did it work for him? So if we look at Jonah 1, we'll, we'll find the answer there. Um, would somebody like to read Jonah 4, verse, or no? So Jonah 1, the whole chapter is what we're looking at. So let's just take a look at Jonah 1 just briefly, see if we can find the answer. Um, so once again, the question was, where was Jonah hoping to find peace and rest from God's call? Anybody? Any takers? That's right. Tarshish. So he goes to Joppa to get on a ship to go to Tarshish, right? Or Tarshish, however you want to pronounce it. So yeah, that's the answer. Is correct. Um, so I'm just going to read part of it. I already read part of it at the bottom, but uh, let's just... Uh, I'm just Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Uh, speaking of irony, here's one. Um, so it's interesting. Anybody know who the main god that they worshipped in Nineveh was? How many people are familiar with Dagon? What kind of god is Dagon? He was also... Yes. So kind of again right so here you get swallowed by a big fish and he's going to preach to the people yeah okay uh, thank you pastor appreciate your input okay so uh, the lesson reads after that that Jonah set off in the opposite direction that God called him uh, he didn't even reason with God which is interesting uh, as other prophets did uh, Moses reasoned with him if you look at Exodus 4, 4 verse 13 uh, interestingly enough this wasn't the first time Jonah had been called to speak for God uh, if we were to go to Second Kings, we don't need to go there right now, but in Second Kings 14, verse 25, um, we also find this, uh, Jonah mentioned there. And uh, so it says, however, Jonah appears to have done what the Lord had asked him to do before, but not this time. So if you go to Second uh, Kings, you would see that he did what God had asked him. Uh, let me just, I'll just pull it up real quick. Uh, 2 Kings 14, verse 25. He restored the testimony of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amadi, the prophet who was from gath Heifer. I think that's Heifer. How would you pronounce that? Heifer? No? <laughs> we'll, go with, we'll go with Heifer. Um, so here you see that, uh, you know, this is speaking of... of Jonah. So, uh, and here you see that this time that he doesn't do God's bidding. Historical and archaeological records document the cruelty of the Neo-Assyrian overlords who dominated the ancient Near East during the 8th century BC, the time that Jonah ministered in Israel. About 75 years later, the Neo-Assyrian king uh, 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 Sennacherib attacked Judah Israel and Samaria already had fallen about 20 years earlier and King Hezekiah apparently had joined a local anti-Syrian coalition. Uh, so if you remember the stories, you know, of the, the uh, northern kingdom, right? Uh, this was the, the Neo-Assyrian 
kingdom or king. Um, so now the time had come for the Assyrians to settle the accounts in the Bible, 2 Kings 18, Isaiah 36, historical Assyrian documents, and the wall relief of, Sen uh, I always get, have trouble with that name, the Sennach Sennacherib palace in Nineveh and tell us the cruel story of the fall of Lashish. So yeah, you can find that in Isaiah 36 and 2 Kings verse 18. One of the most important and well-fortified southern bordered fortresses of Hezekiah. In one inscription, Sennacherib claimed to have taken more than 200,000 prisoners from 46 fortified cities that he claimed to have destroyed. When the Assyrian king took Lashish, I already read that, uh, uh, hundreds of th or thousands of prisoners were impaled, hardcore supporters of King Hezekiah were flailed alive while the rest were sent to Assyria as cheap slave labor. The Assyrians, could have been, the Assyrians could be incredibly cruel, even by the standards of the world at that time, and God was sending Jonah into, a very, into the very heart of that empire. So yeah, it's made, uh, understandably that he didn't want to go, right? Um, I'm just going to read the bottom here. It says, fleeing from God, have you ever done that before? If so, how well did it work out for you? What lessons should you have learned from that mistake? All right, any comments? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, if we were honest, that a lot of us have, have been called for, you know, we're being called all the time, and a lot of times, you know, we might, for whatever reason, not answer that call. Yeah, let's just go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we all have our doubts at times when God calls us to do something, you know. I, I think we all do. I know I do. And uh, But I like this, this this one thing that stood out to me now that you, you mentioned that. Um, so being afraid or rejected, a lot of times that's what the issue is, you know, when God calls us to do something or we're not qualified enough, you know. Um, but here's the thing uh, to remember that First, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those whom he calls. Okay? So if you ever feel that you're not qualified for something, God will qualify you for it. I know this personally, too. When I started teaching this class, you know, I was like, uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I was so worried about that, you know. Uh, I don't know as much as other people know that have been in the church for so, so many things, right? But then I thought of uh, I thought of uh, one of the prophets that God had called. You know, he said, "You go right to the king, right to his face, and, and don't look at their faces or be dismayed, because God said He says I'm going to tell you what to say to them, and I'm going to be there for you." So he got the courage and he went right before the king. 
So just always remember that. Whenever God calls you, don't don't be afraid. Just you know, He's got a plan. It's like when they went to the border of the promised land. You know, God had already made the plan for them to go in there and take the land, but they questioned God. And every time we question God, look what happens. You know, God has a plan, and we question God's power. And, you know, and forget that He's all knowing and all powerful. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the thing, you know, uh, Ellen B. White says it had, um, had uh, Jonah listened, you know, he would have been blessed abundantly, but instead of his rebellion, he goes through all these, he shouldn't have had to go through those, if he would have just done what God had asked him to do, and so yeah, that's the message for us too, if we just follow what God says, our life would be so much better, you know, we're not guaranteed, you know, all these good things in life, but God does promise us that we will have good things. Um, yeah, thank you, brother. Appreciate you sharing that story with us. Okay, um, let's go to Monday's lesson, and uh, it's entitled "A Three Day Rest." Uh, so I, I want to just bring up a, a quick question. Um, Jonah tells us that he was in the belly of the whale for three days. Jesus tells the story. Remember uh, of him. Also, he says that just like Jonah, you know, that the Son of Man was going to be in the ground for three days, right? Right? No? Yes? (laughs) Excuse me? 
Right. So, but my, my point is, is, he said three days, right? Was Jesus in the grave for three days? No. Why did he say that? Why was Jonah saying he was in the belly of the whale for three days? Apparently, Jonah was not in the belly of the whale for three days. You, you all know what idioms are? Okay, well, the, the Hebrews or the Jews have an idiom, and when they say three days, it's like, you know, us saying, well, you know, I uh, was stabbed in the back. You know, I got back stabbed, you know. It's an idiom. And, it, and it's true because Christ was not in the grave for three days, was he? Friday, he died. Saturday, he rested. Sunday, he rose. So there's not a total of three days. There's three days involved there, but it wasn't three whole days. But anyway, let's just move forward. Sure. Mm Yeah, that was the point that I was making. Thank, thanks for adding that extra input there. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so a three-day rest. That's why I mentioned it. Uh, Joseph's flight, flight from God was without problem. His short-lived rest was disturbed when God miraculously intervened with the storm. You know, I kind of found that interesting, too, when you read about that, uh, the part about the storm. I, I thought about, you know, it says that this tempest had come, the storm had come, right? The ship being thrown about, and here's Jonah asleep on the ship. Does that remind you of something? That's right. I don't know what the relationship is there, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so it says, uh, it says, miraculously intervened with the storm. God miraculously intervened. Jonah was saved from a watery grave by God, who ordered a fish to save Jonah. However, it was only when Jonah found himself in a forced three-day rest in the stomach of the big fish that he realized how very dependent he was on God. Sometimes we have to be brought to the place where we don't have anything that is this, that this world offers to lean on in order to realize that Jesus is who we really need. I like that. Um, so Jonah's prayer. Let's see Jonah's prayer. Uh, Jonah 2, verses 1 through 9. What did he pray about? And if somebody would like to read that, feel free. So let's see what Jonah prayed about. Anybody have an answer right off the bat, though, what he prayed about if you did the lesson study? That's right. Do you want to read that for us? Oh, you're reading the, the lesson study. Okay. So I'll read, I'll read the uh, scripture. Thank you, brother. Um, Jonah's prayer. Jonah prayed to his Lord God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said... I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul, the deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever, yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Yeah, so you know, he says that he was at the bottom of the mountains, you know, where where's at the bottom of the seas, at the bottom of the mountains, right? Um, but yeah, so he, he says, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. So what's going on with that? Why is he talking about the temple? And he's looking up. Remember, there's earthly temple, heavenly temple, right? Sanctuary. So he's, he's looking up 
towards the temple. Why? Because that's where God is, right? God is in his heavenly temple. Let's see what the lesson says. Uh, though he was... Uh, though he was there in the deep in a very dangerous situation, Jonah in his prayer prayed out about the sanctuary. He looked toward your holy temple. What's going on here? The temple forms a focal point of this prayer, and it should be the central point of prayer in general. There's, a pri there's primarily one place in the Old Testament where God can be found. He is in his sanctuary. So there you have it. Sanctuary is the central point of prayer and communion with God, right? When we pray, where are we praying? You know, we're praying to God, and God is in his temple, right? Why? Well, that's where all the work goes on, the work of salvation, right? Restoration. Amen. Yeah, thanks for reading that, brother. Um, okay, so... Uh, yes. Yeah, and that's where intercession happens. You know, Christ is interceding for us. Well, that's why he's looking to the temple. Thank you, sister. Uh, yeah, so he wasn't referencing uh, the Jerusalem temple. He was talking about the heavenly sanctuary, as we mentioned. Uh, his hope existed because that's where God and the salvation he offers us truly comes from. Um, Jonah finally understood this important truth. He had experienced God's grace. He had been saved. Right? As the big fish spit him out, he understood firsthand about God's love for him, a runaway prophet. He certainly had learned, even if not without some detours along the way, that the only safe course for any believer is to seek to be within God's will. So now he decided to do his duty and to obey God's orders, finally heading for Nineveh, no doubt on faith, as he was heading toward an exceedingly wicked city whose citizens might not like this foreigner, foreign prophet telling them just how bad they are. You know, as I mentioned, could you imagine it would be like going to ISIS today? The reason I say ISIS because uh, guess where Nineveh is? Nineveh today is a city called Mosul in Iraq. Okay. So, of course, Nineveh is no longer there. It was destroyed by the Babylonians and the Medes at that time. Well, after, shortly after that. Um, okay. I'm just reading the bottom. It says, sometimes we might just need to get away from it all in order to get a fresh perspective on things. Though the story of Jonah, who miraculously survived in the belly of a fish, is a rather extreme case, how might stepping out of your normal environment allow you to look at it from a new and perhaps needed perspective? Yes, brother, go ahead.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, brother. Okay, let's go on to Tuesdays. Uh, mission accomplished. Uh, compared to any city in, or town in Israel, Nineveh was a huge city. It was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Um, so yeah, I mentioned a little bit about, uh, about the city. Um, great city, great wealth. Uh, one of the, it was the biggest city at that time. Uh, Jonah 3, verses 1 through 10. What is the response of this wicked place? What lessons can we take from this story for ourselves in our attempts to witness to others? So, uh, Jonah 3. So let's just move to Jonah 3 here. And verses 1 through 10. Um, I don't think we have time to read, but I'm going to give what the narrative is. So we know that Jonah gets there and he tells the people that in 40 days that the city's going to be destroyed. Interesting enough, he doesn't tell them to repent. No, he just tells them the city's going to be destroyed. Right? And so what do the people end up doing when he tells them this? So if you've read the story or familiar with the story, what do the people end up doing? Yeah, they repent. But what do they do to repent? What does the king do? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. The king sat in the dust with sackcloth. Uh, the people did the same thing and they put ashes over their head. Uh, they even put, which is interesting, the Bible doesn't give the reason for it, but they also did that with the animals. They put sackcloth on the animals. Uh, are animals able to repent? No. But, you know what I think? I think that they were showing such humiliation, humility, that they were even to go as far as even their, their, their livestock, which I thought was really interesting. Oh, anybody know what sackcloth is, by the way? Oh, you're, you're, th you're talking about the, uh, the bag that rice comes in. Yeah. Yeah, they call that burlap. Yeah, no, actually, sackcloth is a a black-haired goat. So they would put, and it's very irritating, very irritating. I mean, it's very coarse, you know. And uh, so when they put that on, you know, it's just irritating as can be. It puts them in an uncomfortable position. What do the ashes represent? Why? Do they, why ashes? Why would they put ashes over their head? Um. Basically, all it, all it's doing is um, the ashes re represent desolation and ruin. Okay, so what they're showing in all of this is basically humiliation, humbling themselves before God. Okay, and so it, it it worked, right? Because God had compassion on them because of it, right? That they had repented. This the whole city he had do it. That's a lot of people. Um, Yeah, and the history, interestingly enough, always lines up, you know. You can go on Wikipedia or whatever and find things on history, and you'll see they go perfectly in line with the Bible. Never contradicting. Um, okay, so um, so we know this is what happens in the narrative, and it's interesting that you find a pagan nation, you know, listening to somebody that serves a different God, and it must have been powerful. I mean, that's all that he preached to them was 40 days destruction. And here they're willing, but let me just read something just briefly what might, what might, remember as I said earlier, you know, they had a, a two plagues in a short period of time, four year period, so that might have had something to do with their willingness. But let me just read what Ellen G. White says. Uh, she says, in the time of its temporal prosperity, Nineveh was this, did I read this already? Uh, 
the center of crime and wickedness. Inspiration had characterized... No, I haven't. Inspiration has characterized it as the bloody city full of lies and robbery. Okay? Um, in figurative language, the prophet Nahum compared the Ninevites to a cruel, ravenous lion upon whom he inquired, Has not thy wickedness passed continually? Yet Nineveh, wicked though it had become, was not wholly given over to evil. Okay, so as bad as they were, she's saying they weren't wholly given over to evil. Um, she says that uh, he who beholdeth all the sons of men, Psalm 33, 13, and seeth every precious thing, Job 28, 10, perceived in that city many who were reaching out after something better and higher and who, if granted opportunity to learn of the living God, would put away their evil deeds and worship Him. And so in His wisdom, God revealed Himself to them in an unmistakable manner to lead them, if possible, to repentance. Did you catch that all? So even though they were wicked, there were still a lot of people that were searching for something better. So in a way, they were ready for this, this to come to them, to, to, for their willingness to repent. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so let's see. Uh, while walking in the city, Jonah proclaimed God's message that 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah 3 verse 4. The message was right to the point. Though the details are not given, it becomes clear the message fell on receptive ears and the people of Nineveh collectively believed Jonah's words of warning. In typical Near Eastern manner, a decree was declared by the king of Nineveh in order to demonstrate a change of heart. Everyone, including the animals, had to fast and mourn. Imagine, you know, your animals are fasting too, right? Um, how animals mourn, it doesn't say. You know, we don't know how animals mourn. The king stepped down from his throne and sat in the dust of the ground, a very important sim uh, symbolic act. As I mentioned, it was an act of humility. Um, so Jonah 3, 6 through 9. Compare it with Jeremiah 25, 5, Ezekiel 14, 6, and Revelation 2, verse 5. What elements were involved in the king's speech that shows he understands what true repentance is all about? So let me just ask you, what is repentance or what is true repentance? How would you describe true repentance? I'll just give you a quick example. So repentance means True repentance, okay? True repentance is not going and confessing to a priest and then, you know, you do a however, mar however many Hail Marys and you're forgiven. Because chances are you go right out and do the same thing again. That is not true repentance. True repentance is like this. So I'm walking a direction and going down this path and then I turn from it and walk the other direction. That's true repentance. And that's what we're talking about here. So, um, let me see if we have time for a couple of these. Um, yes. Amen. Yeah, as long as we're willing, you know, and sincere, if we ask God, He will give us and send us the help that we need. But we have to be really, truly sincere that we really want change or that we want to do His will. Because, interestingly enough, you know, when you think about sin, a lot of times, sin is, let's be honest, sin is fun. You know, uh, it satisfies the flesh, you know, or so we think it does for the moment. Ultimately, yeah, at least to the worst thing but truly it's not that easy so we have to have a change of heart and a change of mind in order to be able to turn from it right because otherwise we're just going to still go down the same path we're going to keep praying to god for forgiveness over and over and yes god is long suffering but even god has a point that he reaches so we have to be very careful with that uh not grieve the holy spirit okay so yeah some of them say jeremiah 25 5 says they said repent now every one of his evil ways and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you, uh, to you, your fathers, forever and ever. Um, so yeah, all these verses that I just mentioned, all just mention repent. Revelation 2, verse 5 says, Remember therefore 
from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Okay. Uh, so this, this, the sermon was short, to the point, uh, speaking of Jonah, but filled with correct theology regarding true repentance. While Jonah had been preaching, the Holy Spirit must have been hard at work in the hearts of the Ninevites. The Ninevites did not have the benefit of all the stories of God's tender uh, leading that the Israelites had, and yet they still responded to him in a positive manner. They were saying, in effect, let's throw ourselves on God's mercy, not on our own accomplishments. Let's rely completely on his goodness and grace. Strangely, Jonah, who had experienced God's grace for himself, personally, firsthand, seemed to think that God's grace was something so exclusive that only some might have opportunity to rest in it. So here it's interesting that Jonah, while he was in the belly of the whale, he had God's compassion, right? And he was saved from that possible death, right? But then he goes to the city, and he doesn't want to give the same that he was given? Why was he, first of all, let me ask a question, why do you think that he was, that he was angry um, that they had repented instead of rejoicing and being happy? Why do you think that he was angry and questioned God about saving Nineveh? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the reason is that, you know, of course, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, we don't like to see wicked people, good things happening to them, you know, even as Christians. But God wants to change all that in us because here he's showing us an example of people that were wicked, yet he forgave them. We should be happy, right? But the main thing Ellen G. White says is that, uh, let me find it here. Uh, she basically says that he was more concerned about his reputation as a prophet. So in other words, he told them they were going to be destroyed in 40 days. It didn't happen. So now my reputation as a prophet, guess what? You know, people are going to be thinking that all kinds of stuff. So it was his reputation he was worried about more so than all these children dying, you know, and all these people dying and all these animals that God has said. What does the, the memory text say? says, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand or their left and much livestock? By the way, when he says the right hand and the left, you know, there's, uh, there's some debate over what is being said, but ultimately I believe that God is saying these people truly don't know right from wrong. I mean, if you think about it, we all know right from wrong. It's instilled in us, right? but there's some things that we truly don't know right from wrong. And I can say this truly because there's things that I read in the Word of God that shows us what true righteousness is. Where I used to think one way, now I see that it's not that way. You know, that this is righteousness. And I go, gosh, and here I thought I was righteous and I was completely wrong, right? Um, okay, so uh, that was the first bell, right? Let me see if we can pull this together. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so um, what I want to do is I want to just kind of wrap it up because, uh, I mean, there's still more. We've got uh, Wednesday and Thursday's lesson, but I think I've covered some of it anyway. So here's the thing. Um, what was God really showing in this story? What's, what is the real purpose and the real... Um, message for us in this story. Amen. Amen. For all. Yes, yes. I'm glad you added that last part. Absolutely. 
uh, God, the, the message is that, is God's compassion is boundless. Here we see in this story, think about the sailors. They were pagans. The Bible says that they were praying to their gods. And yet God spares them because of Jonah's witnessing to them. The same thing happened with Nineveh because Jonah witnessed to a pagan people. God spares them. So the message is that he's not limited just to us as Christians. You know, God is concerned about everybody. Remember the story when Jesus and the disciples, when he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was passing through Samaria and they didn't want to welcome him there and the disciples said, hey, why don't we bring fire down from heaven and destroy them? And Jesus says, no. You know, he says, no. Because why? He was compassionate. Jesus said, he said, the Son of Man came to save. He didn't come to destroy. And that's what God is doing in this story here. Uh, so the pagan sailors were, were saved. Um, and, and so all of these people are the benefactors of his compassion. Everybody. So remember that. When you see people that seem so far away from God, don't curse them. Welcome them and try to witness to them because they're just the same as we are and they need God's compassion and saving grace also. Amen? All right. Well, thank you, class, for your participation. I'm just going to have a quick word of prayer for us. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word and for your message for us today, Father. We just pray that we would go further and research the story and get the true understanding, Father, of what it is that you are trying to tell us in these narratives, Father. Uh, we just ask for blessings today as we go into the regular church services, Lord, and I ask that these messages will be upon us throughout the day and that we will further search your, your message and your word to find out what you have in store for our lives. And these I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Ah, yes, it is a wonderful lesson, no doubt. Great story, you know. It's interesting because it's only four chapters, right? And what we can get out of four chapters, we go back and look at it more and more, and hopefully we'll learn more and get more out of it. I know I got a lot out of it, stuff that I didn't even realize before. Yes. Yes. And that's the point what God is trying to do. He's showing us, you know, is this how you think of others? Well, then maybe you should turn your ways of thinking around and remember God's compassion.